food too, why not? It's our Lord eating. Your only Father is a seed that is fitted to his Bless us, O Lord. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and you will give glory together with your Father, your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Father, be this finished with song. Amen. Um, for those that are here for the first time, welcome. And uh, how many are here have not come to adult education stuff here at St. John's this year at all? Okay, well, welcome. We have a full-time thing going on now. And uh, and you can be caught up to speed here with this series because we're going to be kind of bringing together some of the stuff we've done in some past series. I don't know if that's the right word. Right, we did in the beginning our Genesis 1 through 3. We've done uh, Heaven on Earth. Uh, and then we did our salvation history study. And I'm going to bring those together. And we had one before that we don't have a poster for. But I'm going to be bringing some stuff together, especially here in the first uh, seminar uh, that we've done in the past. We get some new things too. But we're going to be covering some ground that we've covered in the past to bring everybody up to speed. Um, I will be building upon what we've done before. So if you come now, but you missed the second one, you come for the third one, you're going to be a little bit lost. Okay, so I encourage you to just, there are the, we have four. I encourage you to go to all of them. If you can't go to all of them, we're recording it. You can pick it up off the internet. There is our internet site that you can pick it up off of. It'll be up like a week after our talk. Okay? All right. First of all, before we get started with this particular series, Eden to Eden, the Garden, the Temple, and the Catholic Church, um, we're going to look, I, I want to just quickly review for five minutes what we did in our last series, our Salvation History series. Our Salvation History series, going through the whole Bible in seven weeks. It was a lot. But we got certain principles down which are necessary in order to go into the New Testament. And actually, this is going to be our first series that I'm doing with you guys that we're going to actually enter the New Testament. And we're going to do that on the last talk. Okay? So, just as a way, by way of review, um, give me some names. Adam. Good. And then? So oh, easy. Day. Seth, Enoch, Enoch, Noah, Shem, who is who? Melchizedek. I don't know how to put it. Okay, who's next? No, well, who's the next guy of the covenant? Okay, Abraham. Abram becomes Abraham, okay? Isaac. Jacob, Jacob, Jacob becomes Israel. Jacob becomes Israel. Okay, who has what? Twelve sons, right? And his son who receives the covenant blessing is Judah. Judah. Okay, and Judah ends up being the tribe from which what great man comes? Let's skip a bunch of people here. David. It's David. And David's son is Solomon. And who's next? Jeconiah. Some of you are going, Jeconiah, Jeconiah. And Jeconiah is the same person as Jehoiakim. <laughs> Jehoiakim, I don't know, something like that. Okay, and then, they, and then who's next? Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, I can try. Who's next? How about Jesus? Okay, Joseph and Jesus. Now, and the reason I want to put this up here real quick for you guys is that um, I know I've been skipping a lot of people, so if you guys are pointing out, that's good. Just skip this guy. That's okay. Just as long as I'm not out of order. Now, the other thing I want to do here is while we look at this list real quick, what are our major events that happen? First of all, we have creation. What's our next major event? The flood. What's next? 
Abraham. Abraham's calling. Okay, to the he goes to the promised land. How about creation and the fall? <laughs> yes, we should have the fall. Absolutely, we're going to talk about that today. Oh, there's two eyes there. Okay, the calling. What else? What happens here? Exile. The exile, right? They sell their brother into Egypt, and so they go into, into Egypt as slaves. Okay, what's next? How about the Davidic covenant? Okay, what's next? Babylonian, Babylonian exile. Okay, and then... <coughs> Zerubbabel. Two kingdoms. Well, we had a split of the kingdoms way back in somewhere in here, right? With uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Zerubbabel returns. Rebuilding the temple. Yeah, and return from Babylon, rebuilding the temple, and then finally we get Jesus. Okay, good. But keep those things in mind. If you guys, if you weren't here, how many were not here for the other series that we did? Okay, well there you go. Now you were. <laughs> What are we doing in this series? Eden to Eden. First of all, we're going to take this historic line, this this, uh, this thing we did strictly on the history, the level of history. A lot of it was dry. A lot of it was just this guy became the father of this guy. We looked at the genealogies. To be honest with you, the last series we did was one of the most boring series to me I've ever done in my life. And so I couldn't believe you guys were actually coming. Because <laughs> <laughs> really boring, just history stuff. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to have more fun this time than we did last time. And we're going to slow it down a little bit. And we're going to look at the story of God, the working of God, behind this story of man. We looked at all the terrible stuff that was going on, the wars and the, all that stuff. And... At some point, I mean, I know I talked to some of you guys and you said, uh, this is terrible. And, and this doesn't sound good. How can this be the Bible? How can, well, we're going to see. Because behind all of that story, God works and continues to work. And he continues to work to bring about the salvation of mankind. Okay? And we're going to look and see what that looks like behind that historical genealogy, that storyline, okay, to see the handwriting of God behind the handwriting of man, okay? Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans is in the New Testament, after Acts of the Apostles, you have the Gospels, Acts, and the Romans. While you're doing that, if you didn't bring your Bible... <laughs> Shame on you because you should have your Bible everywhere you go. <laughs> carry it. Ever. Do any of you carry your Bible everywhere you go now? Please start. Oh, come on. <laughs> Annie, come on. Please. Look, so, let me tell you right now. If you meet somebody in the street and you know about Jesus and they, and they say, but you're a Catholic and, you know, oh, I know that Catholics don't read the Bible. That's where you find out about Jesus. And you don't have a Bible on you. God is going to judge you on that. It's true. Augustine. <laughs> yeah, you memorized it. That might be nice, but you know what? Yeah. Many people among us today, sadly, to say separated brethren, they want to see the text in front of them. They're not going to believe your mouth going like this. But they're not going to accept your text either. <laughs> because there's the King James, and there's the Septuagint, and there's the... <laughs> if you don't want to carry 
to buy with you, that's fine. I'm here to tell you that I have, in the last five years, used my Bible on the airplane, on the bus, at the bus stop, in the middle of the city, in the grocery store, in my truck. But you're confident to do that. Yes, and you know what? I became confident to do it because I worked at it. And that's what you're doing here. The first time I opened my Bible, it was with a Jehovah's Witness. And I didn't even know what I was looking at. <laughs> didn't. And I opened it up, and somehow I found my way to John chapter 1, verse 1. I didn't know what John chapter 1, verse 1 said, and I opened it up. Believe it or not, by the grace of God, there it was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we had a nice discussion. <laughs> and from that day to today, I'm still learning the Bible. But you got to do it, and you got to be willing to do it, and you got to be willing to let the Lord use you in that way. All right. Romans chapter 5. Did I say that? Verse. Chapter 5, verse 12. Mark, you want to give us that reading there? Therefore, just as through one person sin entered the world, and through sin death, and thus death came to all, inasmuch as all sin. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world, though sin is not counted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. Okay, read me that last phrase again. Who was? Who is the type of the one who was to come. What does he mean by type? What does St. Paul mean that, well, who is the type of who? What's he talking about? Jesus, Adam, Adam was a type of, Adam was a type of Jesus. What does he mean? Okay, a foreshadowing. They're just saying he's like. He was like. He was a type. Okay? A foreshadowing. That's a premonition almost. Okay? Turn to 1 Corinthians. It's the next epistle. Chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 verse 20 but now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Okay, verse 42. Um. <coughs> Verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Okay, so again, this contrast with the old Adam and Christ. I'll read you St. Peter Chrysologus. St. Paul tells us that the human race takes its origin from two men, Adam and Christ. The first man, Adam, he says, became a living soul. The last Adam is a, li is a life-giving spirit. The first Adam was made by the last Adam, from whom he also received his soul to give him life. The second Adam stamped his image on the first Adam when he created him. That is why he took on himself the role and the name of the first Adam, in order that he might not lose what he had made in his own image. Okay. Why do we call Christ the second Adam or the new Adam? Why? Why? From what we just read, what I just read you, this quote, why do we call Christ the new Adam or the second Adam? 
Okay, he's life-giving. What do you mean by that? Well, with Adam, he fell. He died. Sin was created. And with, with Jesus Christ, um, he became the resurrected of, of the man that had fallen. So there's this reversal or a restoration in Christ of what happened in Adam. Why else? Well, it's that, it says that Christ's image was created in the first Adam, his image being intellect and will. I mean, the, the fact that God's image is in man, and Christ, so that that image would not be lost, redeemed man. I mean, he made, he stamped okay. his image in man. He, in his likeness, he created him. Okay, so, in the beginning, God created man in the image and likeness of God. Okay? Jesus Christ being God is that image and likeness after which we were patterned. He is the pattern after which we're patterned. Okay? Therefore, when the pattern becomes man, when the image becomes man, he now is, can be said to be like Adam before the fall, or rather, more properly, Adam before the fall was like Christ. Okay? A human being who was in the image and likeness of God, a partaker in divinity. Okay? Does that mean Adam actually had a glorified body before the fall? <laughs> ah, that's, no. a good, that's a good question. Um, we don't know exactly what Adam had before the fall. The fathers aren't clear. Uh, the gifts that we have before the fall. However, in some sense, the answer is yes, in some sense. Glorified like we will have in heaven, probably not. Okay? But glorified in some sense that he had something that we don't have? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to look at what that was. What's the problem? Why is it that Jesus Christ takes upon our flesh? Why? To redeem us. What's that? To redeem us. To redeem us from what? From Adam. Adam. Yeah, from the fall. Again, St. Peter Pisolia says, the second Adam stamped his image on the first Adam when he created him. That is why he took on himself the role and the name of the first Adam in order that he might not lose what he had made in his own image. That he may not lose what he made in his own image. We were, God, we were at risk of being lost completely. Okay? Due to Adam's sin, due to the fall. And therefore, Jesus Christ becomes flesh, is born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay? We've got to keep that in the forefront of our mind. That the fall is the reason why Jesus Christ became man. Apart from the fall, the incarnation does not make sense. Okay? And therefore, in order to understand the incarnation, in order to understand salvation... We have to understand the problem in the beginning. And as much as we ignore the problem, we risk losing our understanding of Jesus Christ and who he is. And that's happened, unfortunately, today. Am I right? In the in modern world, there's no real problem with man, right? I'm okay, you're okay, everybody's okay. And then what happens to Jesus? I don't need to be saved by anybody. I don't need to be saved from anything. And therefore, Jesus isn't my Savior. Okay? Cardinal Jean Danielou says, There can be no serious theology of the Incarnation or the Redemption without referring to chapter 3 of Genesis. To leave it in darkness, to be content with only a small part of the subject, is a risk jarring one's faith in the Redemption. Where original sin is minimized, the Redemption takes the same path. And where redemption is minimized, faith is gone. And I would add, where faith is gone, there is no hope of salvation. I've read that quote to you, some of you before. Okay? He's saying, we got to focus on chapter 3 of Genesis. And I'd say all of chapter 1, 2, and 3. Otherwise, we risk losing our faith in Jesus Christ. When we lose our faith in Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can save us from our sin. No, and nobody else is going to do it. Okay? So it's that important. Doesn't this also combat the heresy that says we're bad or something like that? What do you mean? You know, I think it's a Protestant idea that we can't be... We're redeemed, but we, 
It's like Jesus covers over us our sin instead of us. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. Okay, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. I don't think at this point we can quite say that, but okay. Um, if we want to understand the new Adam, look, even if I just said to you, Jesus is the new Adam, and you don't know who the old Adam was, that statement makes absolutely no sense to us. Okay, and unfortunately, sometimes we ignore chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis. We've heard them 6,000 times, but we couldn't say one valuable thing about it, or very few things about it. Okay? So, in order to understand St. Paul's teaching on Christ, and actually John and the whole New Testament, who sees Christ as the new Adam, we have to go back and revisit who the old Adam was. Okay? St. Athanasius. The first fact that you must grasp is this. The renewal of creation has been accomplished by the self-same word who made it in the beginning. Thus, there is no inconsistency between creation and salvation. For the one Father has employed the same agent for both works, fashioning the salvation of the world through the same word who made it at the first. Okay? There's no inconsistency between creation and salvation. Okay? No inconsistency, because it is the same God who creates, it is the same God who recreates, and my friends, God doesn't change. He made Adam a certain way in the beginning because he loved his child, he loved his creation, and he wanted him to be in communion with him forever. Okay? If we're going to understand Christ's work in the New Testament, we have to understand Christ's work in the creation. Okay? You've heard the quote, you've heard the, the um, famous quote from St. Augustine. The New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. <coughs> the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. There are two aspects of the same reality. And that same reality is God's desire to be united with his children. Okay? And that reality is going to be patterned throughout all of salvation history. God doesn't change. Dr. Richard France says, There is a consistency in God's dealing with men. Thus, his acts in the Old Testament will present a pattern which can be seen to be represented in the New Testament events. These may therefore be interpreted by reference to the pattern displayed in the Old Testament. New Testament typology. New Testament typology is thus essentially the tracing of the constant principles. Come on, you're right. The tracing of the constant principles of God's working in history. The tracing of the constant principles of God's work in history, revealing a recurring rhythm in past history, which is taken up more full, more fully and perfectly in the gospel events. Okay? There's a certain pattern to God's work with man. God never changes. And therefore, whenever we come into contact with the mystery of God, we're going to see the same thing. Salvation history is a big old long book, and it even continues today. It continues past this book. God's dealings with men. But the picture, the story which is told, is the same story. Over and over and over and over again, the same story. With a whole string of different men. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to look at that story. <clears throat> Look at John chapter 1, verse 1. Anson, you don't have to turn it off. John 1, 1. I do that all the time. I'm looking, not thinking. I'm looking in the Old Testament. John. I did that today with the sisters. I teach the missionaries of charity on Tuesdays, so if I wipe out in the middle of this thing, you'll understand why. John 1 Yeah, it's, uh, I do. Yeah, go ahead. 
and forgiveness. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, in the beginning, where have we heard that before? Genesis. Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, through the Word. In the beginning, what did God do? He spoke, and creation came into being. He created through His Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was made nothing that was made in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. What was the first thing that came forth from God in creation? Light. 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 And the light shined in the darkness. You remember, there was darkness over the abyss. And the darkness could not comprehend it. Okay, we could continue on and look at John. We're going to do that in our final study. In order to understand the New Testament, we've got to know the Old Testament. And in order to understand the New Testament, primarily we have to understand Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. How many of you did Genesis 1, 2, and 3 with me? A couple of you. Well, you're blessed by God. Okay? We're going to go ahead and do a quick review, and you're going to help me out and help all these other people out to get us up to speed so we don't have to spend a lot of time there, even though we should spend... Months and months and months. Okay? We'll just spend a little bit of time. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Annie, you want to read that for us? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, and morning followed, the first day. Then God said, Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters to separate one body of water from the other. And so it happened. God made the dome, and it separated the water above the dome from the water below it. God called the dome the sky. Evening came, and morning followed the second day. Who's asleep so far? <laughs> okay. Um, often, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we start to fall asleep because we hear the story, we know the story, we've heard it a hundred thousand times. We're just doing it again. Okay. I want to read you a quote from Saint Ephraim the Syrian on his hymns on paradise as he begins to write his hymn about the Garden of Eden. Okay. Saint Ephraim the Syrian is a doctor of the Church. Um, because of his commentary on scripture. And this is what he says at the beginning of his commentary, or his, of his hymn. I took my stand halfway between awe and love. A yearning for paradise invited me to explore it, but awe at its majesty restrained me from my search. With wisdom, however, I reconciled the two. I revered what lay hidden and meditated on what was revealed. I aim, my, the aim of my search was to gain profit, the aim of my, violent, my silence was to find comfort. Joyfully did I embark on a tale of paradise, a tale that is short to read but rich to explore. My tongue read the story's outward narrative while my intellect took wing and soared upward in awe as it perceived the splendor of paradise. Not really as it re not indeed as it really is, but insofar as humanity is granted to comprehend it. Okay? As we go through Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 quickly, okay, for those who have already done it with us, I don't want to bore you to death, um, we need to take, it, uh, take a new approach at it. Okay? To not just read it as this text, which we've read a hundred times, but read it again for the first time, and read it trying to get a picture of what's being said. Not to read it just simply, okay, God created the heavens and the earth and blah, 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 blah. What does it look like? What's happening? 
What does God want us to gain from this text? What vision do we gain by the words that are written on the page for our benefit? Moses, by tradition, wrote this text for a people that they believed were chosen by God, I believe they were too, chosen by God to save the world, to bring about salvation. Okay? If we read the text and it doesn't mean anything to us, we've got a problem. And it's possible that we're approaching it just from the wrong vantage point. Okay, like I said a hundred times in our last series, we read it like the newspaper article and pretty soon it gets boring and we put it down. Okay? Instead, we should be reading it as a story, as our story of the chosen people of God, as God begins his creation, his plan for mankind. There's nothing there by accident. Nothing. Every detail of the of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, especially is there for our salvation. Every detail. And so it's necessary that we take a close look at that. So we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. First of all, I want to pull out a couple of things for us from that text. Let's read it one more time. It's okay. <laughs> Genesis 1. Yeah? Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Okay, DJ, there's a uh, soup in the hallway if you want any. Right out here. Thank you. Right. Everybody say hi to DJ. Uh, hi, DJ. Hi, DJ. Hello. DJ was in my wedding. Very close Hello. friend of mine. All right. Okay. Um, what do we know about God's creation, God's act of creation? What can we say about it at this point? What's, what is absolutely essential to God's creative act? That it's good. Uh, we don't know that yet. We don't know it's good yet. What else do we know? He spoke. Yeah, that he creates by his word. Okay. What else? What else is, what else is right there involved in the creation of God. What is present there while God creates? The Spirit. Yeah, the Spirit. Did you? Did that be wind? No. Some of your Bibles. How many of your Bibles say that there was a wind, a great wind over the? Okay. The word in Hebrew is ruach. Okay, it can be translated a number of ways: wind, spirit, and breath. Okay. So we know that God's Spirit is intimately involved in this creative act. In fact, as we're going to see, it is through the Spirit that all of His creation comes about. Finally, what's the last thing we looked at there? Yeah, that, that there's somehow involved in this, the very beginning of creation, light, and what else? Darkness. Dark. Darkness. We're going to see that come back in John again, as we just looked at. Okay, light and darkness. In God's creative act, right at the beginning, there's these three aspects that we're going to see as a recurrent theme throughout salvation history. Sam, can I yeah. ask you a question? Sure. You know, reading through this, and I was trying to, to uh, pin down just a you know, my new idea for the first the first thing that he did. And I got so confused because first you see the heavens and the earth and you see the darkness and you see the light and I'm thinking to myself, well, if you, if you wanted to put that into a message and just say two things that happened that first day, what would you do? What would you say? Light and dark? What happened the first day? Yes. God spoke and light came into existence. And dark also. Well, there appears, it's, it's a good question. You're struggling with what's, yes. what's before the first day and what's in the first day. Darkest and it, we, what we don't want to do with Genesis, especially, especially the first three chapters, is to try to stretch them to say more than they're trying to say, to give a biology lesson. Mm -hmm. Moses wasn't interested in giving a biology lesson. As far as I'm concerned, it's a fine biology lesson he does give us, but that's not his point in the text. So, where this darkness comes from, for, what's that? It was there. 
Yeah, but is darkness something which is uncreated in a sense? The uncreated God condemned in the early church. What was that? Darkness doesn't exist. It's the absence of something. Good. All right. Darkness is the absence of light. Okay. If I turn off the lights in here, it's not like I turned on darkness. Okay? The way to look at that is the same with the grace of God and sin. It's the same parallel. Okay, right in line with this light and darkness thing. Throughout the scriptures, we see those two things parallel. Grace and sin and light and darkness. Okay? So, it's not exactly clear. Okay, I'm going to tell you right there at the beginning, things are a little unsure. What's this, what does it mean that things are unseen? Okay, or what does your Bible say? It's uh, void. Okay, the Hebrew word is, is really unseen. Why is, why is it unseen? Why is nothing seen? Oh, yeah, there's no light. Jesus darkness and light. There's nothing here unseen. Or it's it's uh, unseen or void, formless and void, formless and void. Okay. So, anyways, these these three points at the beginning, these three images that we get, are going to become very essential for us as we walk through salvation history, and we see God's creative hand again and again come to mankind to restore them to what was lost at the fall. Regarding the Spirit, just quickly, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, hovering over the abyss. And therefore, when the water is parted in day three and dry land appears, that dry land, that land comes forth, in a sense, into the realm of the Spirit. Okay? And God creates man on that dry land. In fact, from that land, he creates man. Okay? And man then stands then, in a sense, in that atmosphere of the Spirit. The church fathers say Adam was naked before the fall, but he was clothed in the Spirit of God. Okay? So just think about that image. Did the, did the land comes forth into that realm of the spirit, into the realm of the life of God. And same with man as he's created. He, he's created and brought forth into that life. Okay? And whoever was asking about man's, uh, how, he was, how Adam was before the fall, and I would say, he was made in the image and likeness of God. I, he was given the grace and the life of God within him. Okay? And what that does to man is something definitely supernatural beyond our beyond natural occurrences. Okay? Any questions? No, okay. On day six, what's created? On day six, what's created? Man is created on day six. And man is made what? In the image and likeness of God. What does image and likeness refer to? Yeah, intellect and free will. Well, I've got three answers so far. What's it refer to? First of all, the church fathers, the church fathers oftentimes used, used the scriptures, they were battling certain heresies taking place. They used the scriptures to go out and battle those heresies. And so we listen to them, we receive their teaching, but also we're also free to study the scriptures on our own. Okay, with the guidance of the church fathers to take what they've learned and even to add to it. The, the scriptures are infinite. They're the word of God. And so the depth of our study is unending. We could, we'll never end studying the word of God because the word of God is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus Christ is divine and divinity is infinite. It's beyond our, our capacity to bring it all in. But so why do you mean okay. in his own English? In his own image. Means what? Okay. Refer the church fathers pretty consistently say this refers to man's nature. Who said free will, intellect and free will? It's his intellect and free will. The soul. Okay. That he's made in the image of God because God is all knowing. Okay. And he is all good. His will goes forth in love. Okay, man is made in the image of God. What's likeness refer to? Virtue and priority and all those things that are godly. Grace. Grace, yeah. Okay. Again, pretty consistently they interpret the text in that way. There's something more, though, that I think we could look at. 
And that is what Annie said in the back. What was that, Annie? The image and likeness referred to? Sonship. Sonship. Why do you say that? It points out Adam is the son of God. What? I was just thinking of the, the reference in, is it Noah? The, um, Before Noah. Before Noah. Chapter 5. Mm-hmm. We'll turn there. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1. Go ahead, Amy. This is the record of the descendants of Adam. When God created man, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female. When they were created, he blessed them and named them man. Adam was 130 years old when he begot a son in his likeness, after his image. And he named him Seth. Adam lived 800 years after the birth of Seth, and he had other sons and daughters. The whole lifetime of Adam was 930 years. Then he died. Okay, so in in chapter 5 of Genesis, Moses gives us another reference to image and likeness, and that image and likeness refers to what? Sonship. Sonship. Yeah, his son. Okay. It's a Hebrew way of saying son. It makes sense. One who's in your image and likeness is your son. But even with that, we can use what the church fathers have given us to get a fuller understanding. Okay? That Adam is a son of God, not only because of his nature, but also because of supernature. Right? Because of the supernatural gift of God, the grace. So man images God in a natural way, like Seth images Adam in this text in chapter 5. Okay, but also in a higher way that he has been given, given a bestowal of grace. And grace, oftentimes in theology, we use these heart, these terms that. But what is grace? What is grace? A gift. Okay, yeah, literally, it's a gift. Okay, but what else? We're talking the grace of God. Participation in God's life. Yeah, exactly. Could you say they were equal in dignity? Who's that? God. Adam and God. I, I don't want to say equal in dignity, but I would say that we're going to have to... Man. I, I, what's that? Man, man of God. God. God created man in the image of himself. Yeah, and he gives him a dignity, you're right, which is like God's dignity. Yeah. We're going to look at that. But, okay? but, mean, but I wouldn't say necessarily equal with God's dignity. Why okay. is it no grace in this country? Yeah, simply that, the life of God. Grace is the life of God. That's it. I shouldn't say that's it, but... It's the life of God which he desires to bestow upon man. It's the gift of his own life. What's man told to do in the beginning? What's he told to do? Yeah, be fruitful and multiply. What else? Yeah, to be fruitful and multiply. Oh, that's really bad death. And have dominion. Okay? So it's not like God just says to man, Ah, I made you in your image of likeness as, as my son. That's it. No. He's given a certain command to live out his image and likeness. To live out his sonship. To, in a sense, accomplish what God has designed him to accomplish. And when he accomplishes that, he will reach perfection. In some sense, like a baby. Okay, coming to full stature. Okay? That I'm able to give my baby everything I want to give her as a, as a baby, as a child. But then, I got it, it continues. And at a certain point, she's got to stand up on her own. And walk on her own. And show that she is actually my child. Okay? And not only by walking and eating and doing those natural things, but by living a life of grace, which I, thank God, am able to give her a participation in as her father. Okay? Did I bring her to holy baptism? I bring her to the Holy Eucharist, to the liturgy. I bring her to confession. I bring her to all of these ways in which God gives us a participation in his own life. Okay? So even in our in our existence as, as parents and children, the same parallel exists. Okay? That Adam is creating the image and likeness of God, but it's an image and likeness which he must live out. Okay? He's called to a further end. I lost my notes.
uh, Sedona the Syrian, a church father, says, Like a living sacrifice suitable and pleasing to God, he employs his body for rational service. He consecrates and somehow presents to God the vows and offerings of all his limbs and offers sacrifices suitable for the actions of grace. Okay? So a man, by his action, lives out his calling as a son of God. Is it really hot in here? No. No. You're saying yes, it is. <laughs> so now that he says it's hot, it's hot. If you want that for just a minute, just honestly 30 seconds. I won't blow you guys out. St. Gregory of Nyssa, this is a great quote, talking about um, uh, dignity. Let us add that man's creation and the image of the nature that governs all demonstrates precisely that he has from the beginning a royal nature. Following common usage, painters of portraits, as well as representing their features, express their royal dignity by garments of purple. And before this image, one is accustomed to say, the king. Thus, human nature, created to rule the world because of his resemblance to the universal king, has been made like a living image that participates in the archetype by dignity and by name. But in place of purple, he is clothed in virtue, the most royal of garments. Instead of a scepter, he is endowed with blessed immortality. Instead of a royal diadem, he bears the crown of justice in such a way that everything about him manifests royal dignity by his exact likeness to the beauty of the archetype. That's beautiful, isn't it? By the way, if you guys, if you, I hope you're reading the bulletin column during Lent, maybe. If you're not, it's in there during Lent. It's just all church fathers. It's not me on my soapbox anymore. It's just, uh, okay, so I highly recommend that you read the exhortations of the church fathers. It's so beautiful, especially during Lent. Oh. Okay, so man is called to live out that image and likeness of God. We're going to come back to that. Real quick, some of you guys can help me with this. I'm sorry if you've done this, some of this stuff before, but just to bring everybody up to speed. God creates in how many days? Six. Six days. And on the seventh day, He does what? Rest. He rests. Yes. What's created on the first day? Light. Light. What's created on the second day? Okay, the sky and the sea. Okay. Uh, sky and sea. Okay. What's created on the third day? Land. 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 Don't look at your Bible. <laughs> What's created on the fourth day? No. You're <laughs> trying to trick me up. I'm standing up in here. I'm kind of having my head on. Sun and moon and stars. Yeah, you're right. The, the rule, right. So you say sun and moon, okay? What's created on the fifth day? The birds and the fish. And what's created on the sixth day? Man. I keep walking backwards like that. Man and? Animals. Animals. How do I memorize that? Here, quickly, tell me. What's the pattern? Oh, come on, people. Mon, what's the pattern? Okay, the first three days, God creates the realms, the worlds, if you will. Okay, the realm of light and darkness, sky and sea and land. And in the second three days, he fills those realms with its rulers. The sun and the moon. Okay, the birds and the fish, see, sky and sea. And man and animals and the land. See that? He rests. He rests. Good morning, Anson. Anson's been in this Bible study like six times. <laughs> and then like another five times with my brother. So, all right. Why does God create in seven days, Annie? Because seven is an oath. Seven is no. Wow. Come on. Come on. Give us more. What do you mean seven is no? What? Perfection. Seven means perfection. Really? Okay. Why does seven mean perfection? 
Because that's what somebody said. No. No, she's not white. What's with that white? That's not That's seven. I don't know. Seven's not my favorite number. Oh, it's all right. Yeah, no, don't forget to Father Selma's out here working. Listen in, we got to win the parents. Thanks a lot, Father. It's completion. Why? Who said? Who said it's completion? Yeah. Annie, come on, help us out. I was already wrong. Okay. Anson, what's going on here? Why is God creating seven days? God doesn't do anything by accident. Actually, Why is he creating six? <laughs> Why is there seven days of the creation story? Why does he culminate in his seventh day? Don't play games with me. Why? 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 Because do you want the set number seven, what it means? It, it, it means the word is English. Uh, uh, seven, which means to swear an oath, which is the root word of Sabbath, which means resting. Yes, yeah, you want men to rest. No, no, no. Okay, hold on. <laughs> By the way, Anson, really great Bible study guy, and he teaches a Bible study over at St. Catherine's. Yeah. Good stuff. Find out from him later. You can go like about the Bible studies to him. Okay. In the Hebrew, the word for seven, okay, like we have the word seven, right? Seven. The word for seven is? Shabbat. Shabbat. Okay, and it's the same root of that word is the word for, oh, I should have done this differently, whatever. It's the same for the number seven and for oath. And so oftentimes the Hebrew people wrote in a way, or God communicated to them in a way, in a sevenfold pattern to tell them that he's doing something within an oath. That he's created within a covenant. An oath is, a, is something taken in a covenant. All right, I didn't want to get into this, but we're going to have to look at it real quick. Turn to Genesis chapter 21 real quick. Genesis chapter 21. Sorry if some of you guys have done this with me before. Trust me, the second one, third one, fourth one, it's all new. I just got to lay a groundwork so we're all on the same page here. Chapter 21, verse 22. Chapter 21, verse 22. I'm going to read so I'm going to do it fast. At that time, Abimelech and Philcol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, Abimelech's another guy out there dwelling around the same area as Abraham, it says to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Now therefore, swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but as I have dealt loyally with you, you will deal with me and with the land where you have sojourned. And Abraham said, I swear. When Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham said, Seven ewe lambs of the flock apart. And Abimelech said, Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you will take from me from my hand that you may be a witness for me that I dug this well. A witness. Therefore, the place is called Be'er Sheba. Okay, or with a B. Sheba, it's, it's interchangeable, B or B. Okay? Be'er, it simply means well. It's the well of swearing or the well of oath. And to show Abimelech, to show forth what's taking place as a sign of the covenant, Abraham takes seven new lands. Not eight, seven. Because the root of the word literally shows forth to Abimelech covenant. Okay? And so God creates in the beginning, in a sevenfold pattern, He creates within the confines of seven days in order to tell us, to communicate to us, or to the Hebrew people, that He's not just a, a God separated from His creation. But he's a God which desires to be unified with his creation, to be joined as one with his creation, to form a covenant bond with his creation. And when a covenant bond is formed, the two parties become one. Okay? The two parties become one. Or else have we heard that, two becoming one? Marriage. Regarding marriage, yeah. David Shelton says, God's relationship with Israel was always defined in terms of the covenant, the marriage bond by which he joined her to himself as his special people. How many times in the last series did we hear Israel called a harlot? Okay, Because of that marriage covenant between God and his people. Okay, 
All through the scriptures, that's, there's references to God speaking to Israel like his bride, okay, or like the harlot who left him. That seventh day, what happens on it? God rests. Now man is what? Again, remind me about man. Who is man? Made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, what do we know about man on the seventh day? Help me, come on. Don't make me repeat this for six hundred already created. Yeah? Yeah, he's called to incorporate, be brought into that rest of God on that seventh day, that day of covenant. Man is made to enter into the covenant with God on the seventh day. Okay, to be joined to him. What does God do on that day? He rests. What else does he do? Bless. He blesses and... Blesses and... What's your text say? Look at your Bible. He sanctifies, right? Makes it holy. He makes it holy. And therefore, what is man supposed to do on the seventh day? Bless. Be holy. Yeah, to bless and sanctify creation. Okay? That's his priestly role. Right there in the beginning on the seventh day. Okay. Father Martin, a, a, a theologian who's follower of the thought of John Paul II, says, No one hearing this text in ancient Israel, the, seventh, the text about the seventh day, would think only of a rest for God on this day, but would immediately recognize that God's people were called to image God in a way open to all human beings, but actualized only by Israel. Am I out of time? Yes. Oh my gosh. We said they are called to imitate God not only in his activity but in his perfection of creation by resting on the day made holy by God himself. Okay? So look, man is created at the pinnacle of creation, but man is made for the seventh day. And on that seventh day, he's to fulfill, to become what God made him to become. Not as a little baby anymore, but as a full-blown adult. Blessing, blessing and sanctifying creation. Putting to, to, into action what God had given him as a gift in the beginning. Okay? Turn to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Sorry, you guys are going to have to give me at least a couple minutes here. Just before Psalms. Job chapter 38. <laughs> Ways up there, what? Job chapter 38. Job is just before the Psalms. Whenever God speaks of his creation, his creative act, he speaks of it in certain terms in the scripture. He uses certain images. Okay, and we're going to look real quickly what those images are. Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsels by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Can you imagine God speaking like that? Wow. <laughs> Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? On what were its bases sung? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up in the sea, who shut up in the sea with doors? What's God saying about his creative act? In what terms is he wanting us to understand it? Not only that he did it, but what images does he use? Human images. Of what? Of a builder. Yeah, a cornerstone, a beam, doors, stretching out the line upon its base. Okay, turn to Psalms. There's one book over. This is, we're almost, I'll conclude right here. Psalm 104. Psalm 104, if you have a degree it's 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment. Who has stretched forth the heavens like a tent. Who has laid the beams of thy chambers on the waters. Who makes the clouds thy chariot. Who rides on the wings of the wind. Who makes winds thy messengers, fire and flame thy, me thy ministers. 
Thou didst set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be shaken. Again, taking these images from the building of a great building. Beams and a foundation and a cornerstone. When the Jews read the story of creation, they understood God's desire to dwell with them. And they saw the the creation of God, the creative act of God, in terms of images taken from the Old Testament. And those images are images of a great building. A great building in which God desired to dwell with men. And what is a building where God dwells called? Church. Yeah, or a temple. Okay? A great temple. And so in the beginning, the Jews were accustomed to seeing the creative act of God as the creation and the building of God's temple. God's temple on earth, where man would be invited into the presence of God and be transformed into Him. Okay. Next time, we're going to look at chapter 2 of Genesis. Okay, so do me a favor. Read chapter 1 again, but then read chapter 2 very closely. And do do yourselves a favor. Make a list of all the images you see in chapter 2 of Genesis. Make it a list of the images you see. What are some of the things in, in chapter 2 of Genesis? The tree of life, the tree of knowledge, all of these things. Why do I want you to do that? Because very shortly, okay, next, next class, is we're going to get through chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're going to venture out of the Garden of Eden. And God's plan for mankind will not change. The question is whether man will come into the presence of God again. And every time man comes into the presence of God again, guess what we're going to see? We're going to see the same plan of God to restore man to his place before the fall. And so if we don't recognize our home back in chapter 2, and we venture out in the rest of the sacred scriptures, we're going to get lost. We won't know what to look for. But if we have those images before us and we go out into the story of salvation history with those images before us looking for our ancient homeland, suddenly we're going to see over and over again God rebuilding his home with his people. And finally, and most importantly, when the Savior comes to restore us to what we lost, we will see that home fully restored. Okay? So, I'll see you guys next time. Don't forget the soup, whoever is going to bring it. And uh, let's conclude in the prayer. And bring your Bibles next time. And bring more friends, too. we got plenty of room. In nome of the Father, and the Son, and the Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And the Son, and the Holy Thank you all for coming out to the night.